Okay, and we're on. Hello, good people of the internet, and welcome to Highlands to Islands. Uh, this is the episode where we get to talk to our pal Jordan Bushel from uh, Hennessy. He's the global brand ambassador for Hennessy. And uh, this is an episode where we get to talk about blending. Uh, blending is a, a wildly misunderstood term uh, in brown spirits across the board, in my humble opinion. Uh, and it gets very confusing by the time you start to look at the different philosophies uh, regarding blending as it applies to blended scotch whiskey, single malt scotch whiskey, vatted malt scotch whiskey, uh, cognac. These are all very, very different things. So when we get a chance to talk a little bit more in depth about that, um, we're going to dig into some very specific things uh, regarding how the cognac industry and how Hennessy in particular uh, handles the idea of blending versus what we do uh, in the world of single malt. So with me, as always, is uh, Ardbeg's national brand ambassador, Cameron George. Uh, thanks for joining us, Cameron, because you kind of, not that you have to, but <laughs> you're as big a part of this uh, as me and the pals at Glenmorangie are. Uh, and uh, while we uh, look to reconnect Jordan, I just wanted to kind of rattle a few things off for you uh, uh, and so that we can kind of work through the machinations of single malt scotch whiskey versus blended scotch whiskey. So Ardbeg uh, and uh, whiskeys of its ilk um, would have been very popular uh, as components for blended scotch whiskey mm -hmm. in the early days of blended scotch whiskey, and then they weren't, and now they are again. But Ardbeg's entire output, uh, I believe, is all bottled as... Uh, Ardbeg Distillery output. Is that is that right? <clears throat> yep. Currently, uh, currently, I, I would say like ninety nine point nine percent of it is. Uh, there, there. As we move forward into you know to uh, a more mature Ardbeg as we know it right now, uh, there have been opportunities for some crossover uh, and, and supply going to independent bottlers uh, as well. Um, so, but 99.9% nice. but of it is our big output. And that's another element that we hadn't really even talked about here uh, is independent bottlers. We have in previous shows, uh, but blending and independent bottlers, is that's not their core competency. Mm. I mean, it's not that they can't do it, but a lot of times independent bottlers are bottling single casts anyway, so there's no blending whatsoever. Uh, to clear up some uh, misconceptions regarding single malt scotch whiskey that may exist in the viewership uh, nearly every single malt scotch whiskey is going to be blended together as opposed to being a single cast single malt. There is, a, 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 when we go out and do events, there's some confusion regarding, okay, it's a single malt, so there's no blending. Of course there is. It's all blending from the same distillery's output, though. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm putting together a vatting of Glamorangie Original, that's not going to be a single cast. It's going to be cast of uh, a, a, quite a number of casts uh, vatted together, and they're not all exactly 10 years old. There may be some 11, and there may be some 12. The only thing that you definitely know is they're all at least 10 years old, but they're from this. They're from the same facilities out, but from the same back stock of uh, Glamorangie Mature product, and that's going to be a part of original. So just to clear that up, there is vatting or blending involved, even in single malts. It's just that the entirety of that liquid profile comes from one distillery as opposed to many. So if you look at that in comparison to blended scotch whiskey, that's where things start to get quite interesting because you have the output of many producers being blended together to create a specific set of flavor profiles. And one of the things that I find fascinating about that is that the cognac guys are doing something similar there. It's just that they're working with grapes. And so uh, Jordan is here, obviously our uh, global brand ambassador from Hennessy. We wanted to kind of start picking your brain First and foremost, Jordan, <clears throat> in terms of a question that came up in the in the pre-show that I, uh, Cam, we talked about this. I wasn't quite sure whether you were buying eau de vie uh, that's not yet mature from other uh, farmer distillers around France or whether you were buying mature product. And it sounds like uh, it's almost entirely uh, non-mature eau de vie that then you then manage the maturation of. Uh, is, is that Do I have that correct? Yes, so we work with um, a, a number of different growers, about 1,800 different growers at this point. Um, and a number of those are also what's called a Briere de Cru. 
So they, they grow the grapes, make the wine, and then distill it all on the same property. Um, so they have a small still and, and, and they go from there. Then we have a few of our own distilleries and then we have a number of other larger distilleries on contract. But at the end of the day, it's, we're, we're doing that because we want the, the variety. We want flavors from all over because when we, when we look at cognac, we're looking at a lot of the building blocks of those flavor profiles are coming from the terroir, are coming from the, the earth and the soil and, and the, the farmers that have been working it for generations. So they really bring a lot to the table and that can only be um, shown through the use of their ODB from kind of all over. We look at selection, we talk about as a core pillar. You need to select the best ODB. So you need to work with a number of people to get a variety of those flavors. What's interesting, and this this just now occurred to me, you'd mentioned uh, the distinction between growers and distillers. I was under the impression that growers were distillers. That's not always the case. Is that is that right? The, yeah, that is correct. So we work with um, 1,800 growers and about 800 different distillers. Ah, okay, mm -hmm. cool. That makes that makes a lot more sense to me now. Uh, and so you're looking. The, yep. Uh, I was going to ask, you know, off of the back of that question, you know. Something that's very much so talked about in the art of blending in, in blended Scotch whiskeys is the distillery's intrinsic like DNA and characteristics. You know what really sets them apart. Uh, that's the reason a lot of the times that that Ardbeg was historically selected for a lot of blended Scotch whiskeys. Right was was not only that it was heavily peated, but then also the things that make that distillery you know unique. Um, with cognac grower producers, is there? Uh, especially at a, uh, at a blending level, is there attention paid to um, nuances that may be coming from the specific house stylings of a distiller? Um, or is it more terroir uh, that in the o, o de V that you're looking for? I, I think it's a really interesting thing to, to compare and, and contrast between, you know, the whiskey and cognac, but it's, it's kind of halfway between the two, I think. If, if you're looking mm -hmm. at you know, blended scotch, you're looking at taking the stuff and it's, it's being aged and it's, you know, it's not just the distillery, it's also where it's being housed and, and, and things like that. And it's getting to a certain maturation point. Whereas with um, ODV, it's, yes, it's the terroir is, is providing something, but in general, it's the, the house distillery, they're gonna get the best out of their terroir and I guess that's where it has that nuanced difference. Mm -hmm. But there's not um, there's not going to be that same, you know, Isla to, you know, just south of Edinburgh are going to be vastly different territories in which to sell or something. Whereas Cognac is going to have a lot of that very similar territory to sell or something. And mm. I think you're going to get halfway in between those crazy nuances of like Ardbeg to something else versus... Um, the the ODV themselves. I think the 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 slight changes every year within the ODV really add up to how it's going to be aged differently as well. It's like I, I talk about babying the ODV. You you kind of have an idea based on yes, okay, this we got it from this distiller, this family. Historically, it's done this, so this one looks like that. But then every year you go back and check to say okay. Well, it's it's not handling new oak as well. We feel like it's got as much spice as it can handle. Let's put it in a more seasoned barrel now uh, to ride up the rest of its time until we feel it's mature enough to to blend. And those choices so, are made brings, on an on an ever changing basis or an ever evolving love basis. It. it brings up an interesting point about the the I'm guessing the more finicky nature of the grape versus barley. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, the the regional designations within Cognac, uh, Grand Champagne, Petit Champagne, so on and so forth. And my understanding is that it's soil composition to a degree that creates those differences and that the the resulting fruit, the resulting eau de vie from those fruits is going to mature at different rates and so on and so forth. But it kind of highlights the idea that you're still working with a grape uh, and that uh, my assumption is that as you work from year to year, in terms of the ODV uh, output from even the same place and the same distiller, you're still going to have variances that you have to factor in and account for uh, as those ODVs mature. Is that, is, am I, do I have that correct? 
Totally. And and Cameron knows this from, from being in trainings with me that it's, I harp on the grape a lot because the understanding is, you know, I came from a bartending world and I knew stuff about wine. I was interested in wine, but it was on the back burner to spirits and, and beer and other things that were kind of more readily in my world as a bartender. Floor staff really focused more on wine. And the, the wine education side really does help with the understanding of cognac, because when you look at wine, you know, you can take the same grape and plant it in different places of the world. And it's going to taste remarkably different, different elevations, you know, different soil structure, all of that. So within cognac, we have six growing regions called cru that are broken down. Um, and yeah, they do grow differently there where one is, is going to mature faster. So it is better in younger cognacs. And the same grape varietal planted, you know, a couple kilometers or miles away is going to be in a different crew, different soil structure, slightly higher elevation, not too much. There's not really mountainous in cognac, but that then is going to change that so that that eau de vie produced from that area will take maybe 10 years or 20 years to reach its maturation and is better and has more nuanced, delicate flavors out of it when it does. And that's going to be better in our much older cognacs. And yet it's the same grape. We can use, there, there are a few other grapes, but 99% of cognac is made from Uni Blanc, one grape. And yet that right. same grape changes drastically um, in where it is. And so we, we talk about the grape being chaos and that to, to blend creates harmony. Oh, interesting. Very cool. Um, the... Uh, Having said that, and, and uh, so you've got this sort of palette of, of tone colors that you're working with from the eau de vie level, um, that sort of leads me into wondering how you, uh, how the, the folks in Cognac look at barrel maturation, wood management policies, because we were talking earlier uh, on the Scotland side of things, you've got a relatively, a relatively straightforward wood management policy that relies very heavily on uh, American X bourbon oak uh, that's typically uh, toasted to a degree and then charred to a two, three, or four degree level. Uh, so we're using used oak, and then there may be an opportunity from time to time to uh, swap out and do a secondary maturation. Glamorgi does that quite a lot. Uh, at Ardbeg, there's a little bit more of a full maturation in a given cast type, and there's an array of cast types, whether they're uh, whether they're sherry casts or ex bourbon casts or, or some other uh, slightly less well known cast type, uh, but we're They'll looking back at to, to blending in a really wonderful way, just from two very you know kind of differing uh, takes on totally. it essentially. Yeah. Yep, and we're looking for, at a fairly narrow bandwidth of the number of times that cask has been used, particularly Glamorgie Ardbeg, uh, first and second fill ex bourbon oak, and really nothing more than. Uh, second fill, uh, secondary cast, whether it's fortified wine or dessert wine, table wine, whatever it is. And then those casts become somewhat useless to us in particular. They may go back into the system, get shaved and retoasted, recharred. But how do you guys, how do you all look at a uh, number of uses in a cask? And does that, do you get certain benefits from, from knackered casts or, or other benefits from new oak or how does that work? So, yeah, and it's... Um there's something there that I want to go back to with, with uh, Ardbeg versus Glenmo in a second, but to answer the question, yeah, it's uh, our cast management is, is really looking at as a comparison to, to both of you or, or to Ardbeg and Glenn Morgie, I'm looking at it as we're not, all of our casks are, are Hennessy casks. Like we're, none of them are going to be, where did we get this sherry from? Where do we, there's no kind of like sourcing involved. It's, we've got our, our own cooperage that makes some of our um, casks. And then we have uh, a cooperage that, you know, is a cousin to the Hennessy family that we've been buying from for years that uh, we get about 75 or 80% or of our casks from. And it's all Limousin oak, which is a wide grain oak. So Corey Vrecken uses Limousin oak, but mm -hmm. um, which is why it's my favorite. Shout out to Corey. Uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, <laughs> The, the limousine oak is wide grain. We like that because it brings a lot of complexity to the cognac. At Hennessy, we say we make bold cognacs. So a lot of our choices go in that direction. But as the grape is chaos, 
we want uh, consistency out of our barrels. And, and not that, okay. that's not to say that you, uh, the, the, the Scotches don't want consistency. You certainly do in a lot of ways, but you want to ride out the time in the barrel to get the nuances of flavor from that barrel. And then you'll blend them together to create that consistency. But we have chaos in the grape. And so we look at the barrel as, as much as a barrel can be consistent, you know, all limousin oak, all uh, heavy toast. We, we don't want stuff that has had other things in it. So we categorize our barrels A, B, C, D, and E. And that's the same barrel will be all five of those in its lifetime. So a new oak barrel is A. After a year of use, it will be a category B barrel. After uh, going into its fifth year, it will become a category C barrel. Going into its ninth year, it'll be a category D. Going into its 20th year, it'll be a category E. E is up until neutrality and you know the death of the barrel. This is um, done for the monitoring of extractable flavors and tannins within the barrel. So obviously new oak is gonna have the most extractable flavors and tannins. When we look at something like five years later, category C barrel, Hennessy VSOP, so Hennessy VS goes in a category A barrel. Category C barrel is largely for Hennessy VSOP privilege because we don't want the bite of that new oak. We don't want the heavy spice. We want a more nuanced level. I talk about VSOP being more Scotch Shrinkers Cognac, obviously not Ardbeg, um, more of those sherry um, port wine finished scotches because we've got the grapes, but you using a barrel that's been used for four years previous, there's only 40% left of extractable flavors and tannins. So this is fitting in that Glenmorangie La Santa, Glenmorangie Kinderuban, like that kind of range where you're getting some sweetness from what was in that barrel beforehand. We've already got that from the grape, but you're also using a barrel that has been used before, whether it is those bourbon or those sherry or port casks where you don't have as much extractable flavor and tannin. Whereas if we were to look at like Woodenville or other bourbons using new oak, they're going to have that heavy, heavy spice at that beginning. I look at this as also when you get into it, um, we don't, we don't worry about a barrel being neutral. When it's neutral, what it means is there's no more extractable flavors, but that's not the intended use of a barrel in its entirety. When you look at the wine world, you can look at wines from like California, like Opus One, that is said to be like double new oak matured. So it's in new oak for a year, and then they take it out and put it in another new oak barrel for a year. Wow. That's crazy. But then you look at other wines that are saying, oh, no, 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 we just want a neutral barrel. Like we want a barrel to have it, a wine interact with the air and like harmonize together, uh, bring some of that young uh, notes uh, and, and discard them and, and bring some roundedness to it to get some oxygen. Obviously, spirits are not getting that same oxidative effect. But for us, looking at that wine world is still a very similar thing where we look at something like Hennessy Black or, or, a, or really high-end one like Parody Imperial. Those are going in category D barrels. So category D barrels are about 10% left of extractable flavors and tannins. And therefore, 90% of that flavor is reliant on what was there to begin with, which is the spirit, the grape distillate. And so what we're looking for out of those is just a, a coming together of that strength. You know, I look at I look at Isla as an example when I'm trying to explain to people, because many people know whiskey better than they know cognac. So when I'm trying to explain that that mentality, I do look to Isla. And when you look at a lot of uh, Isla stuff, it's not matured in younger things. And it's not uh, it's not generally as concerned about that first second fill as more of the, the mainland stuff is. And a lot of it comes out much younger than other scotches. Well, why? Because they have so much flavor in the peak. So you don't need it in, in my eyes, like the oak barrel is adding something that maybe not is not the point. And that might be this a similar way to look at like something like Hennessy Black or Parody Imperial, where you're looking at the grape and the bright flavors, you don't necessarily want that spice. Mm -hmm. So you'd go you know, straight into a deer barrel. Though. Oh, no, I was just going to say that so you'd go straight into a D-barrel if you knew that that Eau de V was going to end up in Black or Parody Extra yeah, or Parody yeah. Imperial. You'd go straight to D. Okay. Well, yeah. the choice of barrel is, is 
is less about where it's going to end up and more about the initial eau de vie. So if that eau de vie is light and bright, um, oh, oh, oh. you you, you don't want to overwhelm it with, with some new oak. So yes, it would. The thought would also be in their head. Yeah, it's going to go there potentially one day uh, if it reaches that extreme age for imperial or or um, or has those light bright qualities. But yes, they would put those lighter brighter ones in that uh, category D barrel so as to bring out those flavors. Mm -hmm. Very cool. You know, to to your point uh, first about you know, there's so much there that I that I was like, oh yes, oh my god, like trying to catch these little nuggets here, Jordan. Um, first, to, to your point about Isla whiskeys generally being being bottled, uh, you know, a, a little bit younger. Uh, yeah, there is absolutely a history of that, and because you know uh, the main point of Isla whiskeys, especially the the heavily peated ones, is um, is that you want the those phenolic notes to to very much so come through. There's a degradation of, of those fen like those phenols and those components. Uh, the farther and farther and farther away that you get from the point of inception, which is the the peating, right? Yeah. Um, even through the maturation phase, those, those phenolic compounds you know, literally fall off um, once you start to, to see whiskeys that are, you know, 12, 15, 19 years old. Uh, there, there's a rounding off of those components. So, one, you're absolutely correct there. Uh, you said something about um, uh, about vatting, uh, not necessarily vatting, but, but aging in more neutral oak uh, and that it is looking for oxidation and kind of a mingling of, uh, of the components that are being utilized. That reminds me, to be honest, a lot of the technique that Ardbeg has kind of started employing uh, when we released Ardbeg NO in 2017 uh, was, you know, taking what are generally slightly younger whiskeys, but with varying components, some first fill uh, ex-bourbon, some second fill, some virgin American oak, some Pedro Jimenez sherry cask, and essentially taking those, putting them into these uh, these giant uh, European oak containers that are that are basically flavor neutral, uh, and allowing the components to get to mix and mingle with each other, thus oxidizing. And actually speaking to Brendan about this, there's not necessarily a flavor development, but there's a shift in flavor. Uh, and I, I believe it was five percent, as as kind of he had he had gauged it that that the flavors just kind of it's they're the exact same, just looking at them through a different vantage point. Um, and, and how so long I, is that process? Uh, so that is 36 months. Okay. Sorry, 16 so, months. Jesus, I apologize. 16 months. So that's very, yeah. that, that would be, I, I was talking about the flavor mingling from a wine point, but it's, it's, that would be exactly like um, the after a cognac is blended, we put it through uh, the collage process, which is uh, for a period of time, uh, VSOP would go for, um, 18 months and so you are yeah one year to 18 months and that would give it that that process of of the mingling of those flavors coming together and it's it's a quality check to be honest and yeah brendan might be right it might be a five percent or something like that but it it allows you to make sure those those flavors are harmonizing together well and that the consistency is there from from batch to batch to batch absolutely <laughs> I, I totally uh, misspoke there. It is three. It's three months. I apologize. Jesus, my brain's all over the place today. <laughs> I, it didn't sit right with me. I combined the first two, and I was like, "No, wait, that's not right." Three months, yeah. So yeah, the, and that's a big. That's a twenty-five thousand liter vessel ish, mm -hmm. uh, give or take. Um, uh, Mike has got a question. I want to look at that in just a second. But uh, one of the things I wanted to clarify uh, from you, because this this would really kind of blow my mind from a blending point of view. We're used to, on the single malt side of things, you've got a distillate that's going to go into a barrel. Uh, and uh, your barrel choice is going to be uh, informed by what you what you hope the end result is going to be. Are you... Uh, it's, it's, so my, my uh, general thought process was you have an ODV coming from a particular uh, uh, grower and then a particular distiller, and then that's going to be uh, uh, put into cask. But are you... So are you blending O to V's together and then deciding no. in terms of maturation? Okay. Matured so a, a and, single then, and then blended, yeah. And then, okay, cool. Because mm -hmm. I, I wasn't sure if that was an, another wrinkle of the of the, of the the blender's art there as far as cognac goes. So um, this is a question from uh, Mike here in my hometown of Omaha. I'm just going to put it up here. 
uh, both any Mary and Cass that are too large for aging, which would be uh, anything over 700 liters of interior volume. Mm -hmm. uh, does Glenmont Ardenbeck do that as well? Uh, Came, I think the only real example of that is what happens with with a uh, no. Clearly, the gathering vat's yeah. far too large to mature in, but it's not a it's not a maturation vessel. If you want to take that question, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think you just nailed it exactly on the head that that's not a maturation. It's not a maturation vessel because we're not looking for uh, flavor development, and also because it is just far far too large to be deemed as such. Right. Yeah. Um, so, Mike, I hope that uh, addresses your question. And what's interesting about your point regarding Balveni is if the maturation happened in casts that were too large for, because that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't necessarily be technically legal by Scotch Whiskey Association standards. Uh, but I'm interested in, so you, I think you even list here what that, okay, 18 to 24. So yes, 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 yes. Um, I think they, they also, they do a Solera vat sort of a thing there at, uh, uh, at Glenfiddich as well. Uh, so those, there are requisite examples in the single malt realm, uh, of, of making that sort of thing happen using a larger vessel, not necessarily as a further maturation medium, but as a, as a knitting together of component mm -hmm. parts that have, that have reached that larger vessel at the same time, but could, if you bottled them right away, feel disjointed and need some time to sort of come together in cask yep. and become a little bit more unified, allow for a little reactive oxidization to soften uh, the, the solventy nature of whatever might be left in that spirit that hasn't vaporized out yet. So that, that's sort of the function, at least in terms of uh, single malt Scotch whiskey. Now, uh, in terms of the blender, uh, going back to sort of the blender's art, uh, from the, the limited amount that I know about cognac, um, you depending on the expression that you're trying to produce, you may be pulling from a relatively narrow range of age uh, ages in cask, or you may be pulling from a really broad range of age, ages in cask. Which of the expressions in the Hennessy range uh, uh, demonstrates those two sides of that philosophy, even if I have it correct in the first place? Um, well, in general, I'm going to say we pull from a larger range of ages than than like age statement um, single malts would, simply because again the chaos uh, and and the chaos at that beginning grape stage means that the maturation points are going to be different. And so you've heard me say that a lot. We talk about uh, maturation over aging because age gets you trapped in this idea that like. A bigger number is better but it's all really about when is that thing best uh and so with the different where when you're pulling from different crew they have different maturation points so when we look at something like hennessy vs it's two to eight years old but on i think if you were to say and correct me if i'm wrong but if you had like glenn morangy tenure the original um you have a lot of, of one age and there's like a, a falling degree of older ages in that to, to create consistency. But there's, there's, there's more of the, the base age in, let's say, a, a 10 year old or a 12 year old or any kind of single malt. Yep. Whereas with, yeah. with cognac, you're looking at more of a pyramid where if I say two to eight, you've got a, a little bit of two and a little bit of eight, but like a lot of five. And there's more mm. five than there is four and there's more five than there is six but there's more six than there is seven and there's more seven than there is eight because that five that four five six here is going to be that in general when we expect the 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 stuff to reach its maturity and anything that's on the outskirts is creating um nuance and and kind of like mm -hmm. adding it's the, the some young elements some older elements uh they're outliers in a, in a way but uh yeah that's our range and so when we get to something as you go up in in age you get a, a wider range because mm. when you look at something like um parody imperial it goes up to 130 years old but it starts at 30. so there's a hundred there's there's a hundred year gap between the youngest and oldest and the median age is somewhere in the middle there okay that's uh, incredibly cool. Um, this thing, and Mike just asked another question that I have to admit, I don't know the answer to, but I have a, I'm going to guess, and uh, Jordan, you might have some insights here. 
Um, uh, and and he'd said earlier that cognac finished uh, uh, whiskey is terrific, and there are some really fine examples of that out there. Uh, but this question here, uh, when whiskey distillers buy cognac casks, what category do they buy? I my guess is older, uh, because they're looking for more in drink and less of the direct French oak influence, because that can be quite a grippy thing. Uh, and it can begin to dominate the flavor profile of, of uh, Scotch whiskey in a relative hurry. It also depends on the um, on the relative lightness or heaviness of the of the distillate that uh, that particular distillery is producing. Uh, but my absolute guess is that they'd be looking for older because it's the flavor of the cognac itself, uh, the rendered in drink from the cognac itself that's going to be the difference maker in the whiskey, and not necessarily the use. Of French oak and French oak would be obviously in a younger in an A or B cast coming out of uh, uh, the cognac industry. You'd have a more French oak influence and less in drink influence. So my guess is older. Uh, you guys want to weigh in on that? I mean, that would be to make it very clear. The category system is a is a Hennessy thing. It's not a ah, cognac okay. thing. Um, mm. Other cognac houses are going to have their own version of the same thing. But it it might be different. Their 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 A might be up until three years or or whatever. All depends on their house style. We have a um, both VS and XO go in new oak, so category A. So we have a bold flavor style. Therefore, we probably have our categories like a few in quick succession. A, B, and C are all still quite young with a lot of extractable flavors. If you were making a, a lighter style of cognac you might have more uh, separation between those those okay. categories for yourself. So I, I would say to find out, you would have to ask the individual um, Scotch producer what sort of yep. things they were looking for in their cognac. Um, I know for a fact that I, I don't think there's a Scotch producer that uses Hennessy barrels uh, because we use our barrels to extinction. Um, <laughs> if there were right. one, it would be one of you two. Uh, sitting right there, uh, but uh, I don't. Uh, I don't believe there's anybody that uses Hennessy barrels because we just don't sell them. Um, and the uh, at the end of the day, it would be yeah. To to your point, Dan, I would be looking for the when you're looking for that barrel. Your your ex bourbon is your your building block. Your finishing is you're looking for what whatever what was in that barrel. If you wanted French yeah. oak influence, you'd you'd be like Corey Brecken. You'd go buy, you know, Limousin oak. Yeah. If new, yeah. You're looking for yeah. If you're looking for the the actual flavor of if you're looking for a cognac barrel, you're looking for cognac. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. You know, I'd exactly. imagine I, I'd also say to to your point, Dan. Um, first off, I think in terms of flavor development, uh, yeah, we're looking for more influence uh, of the actual cognac itself rather than the the cask. Um, really taking on that that grippy kind of aspect uh, as you see in Corey of Reckon, uh, which makes us absolutely mm -hmm. love it. Um, but then I also think, you know, uh, as a cognac producer and especially ones that that are not Hennessy um, because of because of Hennessy size and also the way that they utilize casts, um, you know, I think smaller cognac producers would want to make sure that they are getting as many utilizations out of that cast as they possibly could. Uh, and selling it closer, closer to that neutral, um, uh, rather than than selling, you know, uh, essentially second fill. No. Which makes me wonder, and again, total speculation. I, and now, Mike, and now I kind of want to know. Um, my guess is that Reclamation Coopers in Scotland, specifically Space Side Cooperage, where mm -hmm. the bulk of that stuff is going to come in and go out and be brokered out to all the different distillers, that a cognac cast coming in. It, you probably don't even really know um, where yeah. it falls in that houses in that in that houses process, since most of the houses are keeping their. Ca I mean, I'm I'm guessing that uh, at least the big houses are looking at cask management the way that Hennessy does in terms of we've got a use for this at A, and we've got another use for it at D, and then it's a hundred years later, it's falling apart around us, and and we're it, it's no longer useful to anybody, not just the cognac people, it's just not even sellable. Uh, so the ones that do end up in uh, the Reclamation Cooper's uh, uh, inventory cycle, I wonder if they would even know uh, yeah. uh, anything it, more than country of origin and spirit of origin. 
Mm-hmm. And that that's one of my uh, points of contention with so many people that say, "Oh, we age in in this or we age in that." It's like well, where that came from is a prominent ingredient in your end yep. product. Like that that matters a lot. And if if you don't have as rigorous uh, a cask buying program, what are you doing? Like like what? Mm-hmm. What what's the you know it's like a a Michelin star restaurant not knowing where they get certain spices from or or certain vegetables or anything like that they they know exactly where they're getting it from because they need that certain quality level like if you're gonna put a really beautiful whiskey into a cask what especially finishing it if it's great right now where that cask came from matters a lot does it not. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, and that's one of the things that, uh, and Cam, next time we're over, we'll have to go take the Space Side Cooper's tour. Because one of the things that I want, I want to know is, because they're, they're bringing in, they're grading, they're, uh, they're parting them out to uh, distillers and independent bottlers based on what they know that that distiller or independent bottler is looking for. How do they know? What, where does the, what's the, because they're not exactly getting a, it's not exactly a unified barcode, like, okay, this is, a, this has been used three different times by this distiller, or this has been used at this winery in Argentina or whatever, you'd probably be able to know that, but did that winery use it a second or a third time? Is that, that's going to have some impact on how much in drink and how, how much uh, exhaustion has been in, uh, uh, exerted onto the wood and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that'd be a really fascinating subtopic to to Man. explore from a cooperage point of view. Uh, Dan, it'd be really cool. Uh, yeah, we got to. We're it. gonna need to add into this in into our Highlands to Islands, uh, you know, topics, uh, technology and whiskey, because I think that that's a place where like RFID tracking could absolutely change and revolutionize, um, uh, you know, the our understanding uh, of how many times a cask has been utilized. I, I think with that half joking there, but, uh, but there would be right. something to that. Um, Jordan, a question that I've been wanting to ask you for, for a second as well. I've been trying, struggling to hold it on in my, my Swiss cheese brain today. Um, since you mentioned the, uh, the uh, system through which, you know, barrels are graded uh, at, at Hennessy, the you know five years and then was it uh, nine and then 15 yeah. or 15 20 or it, uh nine to 20 and then 20 to neutrality would be okay e. uh, yeah would be e so through that is you said that it's based primarily on you know residuals and, and extractives that are still yeah. left in inside of inside of barrel even though it's the the barrels you know are as close to uniform as you can probably possibly get them um they are all their own living breathing ecosystems essentially so uh, does that rule stand hard and fast or will some barrels progress through that that arc at a slower rate um that 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 rule is is hard and fast to the point that when we so a lot of our um, barrel maturation facilities, we have 73 of them. A um, uh, number of them are traditional sellers or what we call shea. And they, um, they've they got natural earth floors and things like that. So we handle all the barrels by hand in those ones. So rolling a barrel and, and even handling it by machines, you can damage the barrels and whatever. But handling it by hand, mm-hmm. you can roll over a rock or something like that. If a stave needs to be repaired, that's a new stave. That is taken into account into the mm. calculation of the category. So if too many new staves get put into a barrel, it could take a barrel from a category D back to a category C. Cool. Because that's those really staves cool. will be more extractable than others. Yeah. Will those staves all be new themselves or could they possibly be from you know, uh, like category C barrels. Yes, they could possibly be from other barrels, but most likely, 99%, I'm going to say, are going to be new new staves. Mm-hmm. And that brings up an interesting point that Mike brought up about, um, you know, reclamation cooperages in Scotland are sometimes creating hogsheads. 
and those hogsheads mm -hmm. could be staves from lots of different barrels. Uh, Mark's point here, Mark from Scotch for Dummies, um, they, we should probably do a whole damn show about this uh, because we know, let's say it's Glamorangy. There's there's barcoding at Glamorangy, so you know, and uh, a color coding, a uh, spray painting of the of the barrel heads, so yep. you know what's a first fill, what's a second fill, and then they go. So you you know, but by the time they go, we'll spray paint over the barrel head so that the brand, so that the distillery doesn't show, and they just all grayed out, so that that so that whoever ends up with it isn't able to say this is an ex Glenmo cask because that takes our brand and allows somebody else to leverage it in ways that we have no control over. So we're going to yeah. disguise the the barrel sourcing and the number of uses that that barrel saw at that distillery by the time it gets to the reclamation cooper so how the hell do they know uh and that's that's uh mark that uh these we're gonna have scotch for dummies on uh let's well, i'm gonna we'll we'll put our heads together and do some homework and figure out what the answer to that is uh thanks for the question mark that's awesome I've got um, a little to your point you know our, oh. oh yeah 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 I, uh, I uh i was in just personal vacation and my fiance always, I think she enjoys it to an extent, but we always end up in somewhere related to alcohol. So um, I was in Jerez, Spain, uh, visiting all the sherries and you can go there. And I think that's the start of your RID tracking because a lot of, and you'll know this, a lot of the whiskey producers need so much sherry, but they're actually, they're, the sherry industry wasn't big enough mm -hmm. to give them all those barrels so they bought barrels and sent them down there i was in some of these sherry producers and looking at barrels going i recognize that symbol from somewhere and they're like and i get up close oh yeah it's john jameson and sons like they're they're just right. making sherry to season barrels and then shipping them season back barrels. so that's yep. tracking it they're like jameson would know so anyone else doing yeah that oh, yeah. Would, yeah would know exactly the origin of that barrel exactly what had been in it, the producer, everything. And so it's like, there's something to be said for taking your barrel program that seriously, that you really have a, a, a qualitative like control of, of that process, which otherwise you're, yep. who knows? Yep, good point, Cam. You, you had a thing you were gonna rattle off there, I think. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, I was going to say, uh, I lost it, it's gone. <laughs> um, so to that point, um, the, it takes it's it's two different pathways in terms of the cooperage. Uh, if and, and like our relationship with um, Miguel Martin in Spain services both mm -hmm. Lamorgia and Ardbeg, and the the not the bulk but a giant uh, chunk of his business is is, uh, is seasoning cast for the Scotch whiskey industry. So if you and it bypasses the reclamation coopers, it bypasses Bayside Cooperage because you know who has your cash, you know what he's doing with it, and you know when you're going to get it back. So the provenance is already established, and then when you get it, you know what you're working with. Uh, if you weren't, if you if you weren't that uh, hyper intensively involved in your wood management program, then you might be a little bit more uh, susceptible to chance. Uh, as far as that goes, to sort of George's point, the you know uh, aggressive wood management is going to benefit uh, obviously both sides of the equation, the cognac folks and the Scotch whiskey mm -hmm. folks. Um, I wanted to bring up uh, one of the uh, single most fascinating things I think about Hennessy is that um, you know in Clamorge and Ardbeg we have a, a static, uh, what we call a whiskey creation team, and they do all the blending, uh, and you know their palates, uh, the the essentially. Glamorgy and Ardbeg as brands, uh, the reputation of those brands rides on the backs of these three people, and they handle everything. Uh, uh, Bill, Brendan, Julian, they handle everything. But they haven't been around for seven damn generations of the same family of blenders. Uh, and the, the fact that the, the, the Hennessy folks have been using this one family for that many generations, what's behind that? What's what's the is that is that an exercise in consistency, or they just have some wacky genes, or what's going on there? So I, I think it's twofold. When you're when you're in cognac, I think you can look at cognac almost like uh, like I've heard Brendan talk about Isla. That like Isla's that small community. Everybody's there. Everybody knows each other. That's cognac. It's a small town. You know, everybody that makes cognac is from cognac. It's not like you move from somewhere else in France to, to make cognac. You're, you're, you grew up there, you were engulfed in the process as a child. Everybody you knew was either um, making cognac or 
part of the or servicing the industry. You know, we need doctors and we need, you know, uh, policemen and everything like that as well. But everybody else is making cognac there uh, or part of that process. And so the family has been ingrained in that. But when you look at EDV that are being blended, you know, when we look at Richard Hennessy, it's up to 200 years old. So you're blending from eight generations ago. And there's something about working in a family that you have a lot of, there's, there's more gravitas there to do that correctly. There's more gravitas to carry on the name. And more so if you're using something that's 130 years old or 200 years old as an ODB in a blend that your great, 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 great grandfather made. Well, you then it's incumbent on you now to pass something down that will be equally as good or better to your great, 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 great granddaughter or grandson or anything like that. And so we're on the eighth generation of the Fiviu family. Um, and it's it's really when you listen to Maurice Hennessy, the eighth generation of the Hennessy family talk, it's about love and trust that the Hennessy family trusted the Fiviu family to consistently make great products from year in to year out and pass down that knowledge. But it, it went back the other way as well, the Fiyu family trusted that the Hennessy family would not make business decisions that would compromise their ability uh, or force their hand into making inferior products just to, you know, satiate some business venture. So it's it's really sure. about the two families coming together and growing together in that way. And it is something that's really unique in in it's not it's not just the the cognac world. It's pretty unique in in the spirit world. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a really I hadn't thought about the angle of uh, a, a relatively fixed community. So if you're if you're a, a member of the Philly family, you know, you know who these produ- you know, who the growers are, you know who the distillers are, and you've known that for generations. And so if it's not necessarily just about these people are all born with sort of golden palettes, so much as it's carrying out on these relationships over generations, which is totally. part of where consistency is going to come from and and the insights to be able to take the input from those growers and distillers and continue to make this amazing stuff uh that i hadn't really considered that angle and it's that's that's really amazing well you know, if you think um, about it from uh, that isla standpoint like uh if you use and i'm using isla as an example just because it's i've been there a few times lucky enough and it's 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 just this microcosm of awesome but um, it's everybody there probably has a better palate for Isla Scotch than anyone else in the world because they just grew up drinking and being around and smelling only that. Like when you smell peat fires every day, you probably have a better understanding of that, the peat nuances than, than somebody that, that, that's just visited and things. And I think that's, that's something really, really, that's exactly what's going on in Cognac. They're, you know, as teenagers, they're in and around the distilleries. They're they're smelling this stuff. They're they're involved in the process in some way, and so it's it does bring something to the table. You know, something that that that, that really kind of brings for me, since we're on a, a conversation uh, of how you know lineage and production are kind of intertwined when you start talking about about Hennessy and and the Few family. Um, as the world around us continues to change and uh, a, a as well as starts to heat up and we're experiencing climate change, I guess that brings to the table a, a conversation that I'm, I'm wondering if, if it's already being had at a, at a blending level. Um, is there attention to, to the fact that these O to V and their regions might start to change, um, you know, in, in the art of blending and Hennessy being so entrenched in utilizing, uh, you know, O to V for their specific tra- strengths uh, are they already having that conversation as a blending team? And I- um, yeah, and that's a great, great point um, that, you know, I, I like to say you're either you, you either realize climate change is happening or, or you believe in climate change or you're wrong um, mm-hmm. because w- we know it's happening. Um, it's we've had to change our um, harvesting time for the grapes to be earlier in the year. We used to harvest in October. Now we start harvesting mid-September a lot of times, uh, and that's wow. to preserve the, the flavor of the wine that we want. Um, mm-hmm. And that, of course, changes, you know, that, that can change distillation, but it's 
we have been a whole research and development team uh, devoted to this, where we're even playing with new varietals of grapes that, if um, that that are minor varietals historically in cognac, may become major varietals in, in the in the future of cognac mm-hmm. because they just they react better to warmer climates. Right now, Uni Blanc, um, you've heard me say it is well. That's better known as Trebbiano in Italian wine circles. Well, Trebbiano in Italy is a, is a great light, bright table wine. Cognac is a higher um, you know, cooler climate. It's, as far as I know, the most northern region in which uh, Uni Blanc grows because we're not making wine out of it. Well, we're, sorry, we're not making table wine out of it. We're making mm-hmm. wine out of it for the purpose of distillation, which is not good wine. The same way, you know, whiskey is making beer uh, to, to distill, it's not good beer. Yep. Um, yep. So yep. You're, you're, you're looking for those processes to distill. And we want um, light, uh, highly acidic wine, which requires a cooler climate. And so we're looking at new varietals. So you never know, like, but it takes more than, sorry, it takes more than just growing a new grape. You have to then do distill it and mature it to make sure it can yeah. still maintain the same flavor profiles within the cognac uh, that we've had historically. And this is not a new thing. Uni Blanc was not always the major varietal. We had a bug that killed all the grapes in late 1800s known as phylloxera that uh, actually caused the the whiskey industry to have a, a major boom because cognac kind of went away, but um, phylloxera killed a lot of the grapes and the, the process to healing ourselves was a grafting process and grafting on new vines or grafting on new root structures changed the flavors of the traditional cognac grapes forever. And so Uni Blanc better represented the original flavors um, than, than they did, than those original grapes did after um, the grafting process. So the same is true of climate change that Uni Blanc may change flavor, but a new grape may better represent what Uni Blanc represents right now or has historically, you know, 50 years from now. Mm-hmm. Now, Mike is, yeah. I was, I'll just rattle this off quickly. Mike's got yeah. a question regarding, um, is your library of spirits already reflecting uh, changes due to climate change? Um, I would say where our research and development is, is, is reflective of that, but not the uh, resting of the We have adjusted earlier in the season for that. Uh, and as long as we have that high acidity, we're, we're good. Mm-hmm. Now, I had a Got question it. to go back to blending earlier on uh, before we yeah. talked about the categories of casks. We were talking like Glenn Morangy has has one style of, of maturation, and Ardbeg is is distinctly different. And 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 by that I mean Ardbeg runs things uh, parallel, where um, you would have something in an ex bourbon cast and something in. Uh, I'll pick on Corey. Well, not pick on Corey. I'll, I'll reference Corey again. Something in Limousin Oak, and they run parallel to each other. And then they're blended for bottling, if I'm not getting that mistaken. Whereas Glenn Morangy is taking something and then finishing it. So in that way, those are two different methodologies as far as maturation goes. How, why, and, and what, is, what is the methodology behind the two? Because that, it, like, it would seem to me that like Ardbeg is, is likely closer to cognac in that way in that you're taking two different things that's that's different and yet our maturation style we're taking those out and moving them around barrels as well so it's like we're kind of part glen Morangy in the style but then you know i don't know it, it, it it's there's something really interesting there it's like cognac's kind of stuck in between the two i think mm-hmm. uh, in that okay, like a mean, crew uh, uh, sorry, I'll just yeah. finish the point. Like a, a, a crew, oh, yeah. we we might say Grand Champagne. Okay, that's that's kind of like our art bag thing. Like Grand Champagne, Fimbois, like the different crew are going to age uh, separately, but in so doing, we're going to move them around because of the chaos of that grape to different barrels. And so in that way, we're like Glenmorangie, but in oh, that yeah. we keep the crew yeah. uh, separate until the very end. We're kind of like art bag in that way. And so what? why the two styles and what do they both bring to the table that's that's very cool that's that uh, is really cool 
you can you want to handle the arm bag hand, half of that? Yeah, uh, before before you jump into Glenn Morangy, because I do think it's important that we s- start the conversation with Glenn Morangy, and I'll pick up with Ardbeg. I do think that it's important to point out that that's the whole reason that that we do this show is because you know it. <laughs> uh, Glenn Morangy and Ardbeg, you know, maturation matters to to them. To be single malt, maturation absolutely matters, but it's the take on how you you approach that maturation that really does separate these two distilleries. So I'll turn it over to you, Dan, to nail Glenmo first, and then I'll take Ardbeg. Right. Um, it comes down to the robustness of the new make. Um, it is easier, nicely done, by the way. Uh, it's a delicious dram. Um, I, when you look at uh, Glamorgi, is a new make. It's a delicate, light, fruity, floral style. It it's malleable and takes on the characters of the of the cast that it is maturing in relatively readily. Which means that if you did full maturation of uh, Glamorgi product, say in a ruby port cask, you'd lose it within the first few years to the wood. And so there'd be really no no discernible balance there. But because you can shade it towards the end, Glamorgi plays really, really well with ex-bourbon oak. So you want to establish the house style in ex-bourbon and then shade it in different ways where you would, if you tried to do the parallel thing, and, and we talk about this stuff all the time because for the bulk of what Ardbeg does, yes, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, not, it's fundamentally different. It's parallel as opposed to in series. Glamorgi has to be in series because we'd lose it to the wood otherwise because it's already, as uh, on the new make uh, level, it is a light, fruity, and floral thing that you would you you really don't like uh, in the example of uh, uh, Alta. Alta is a really good example of this. So the difference between Alta new make and uh, standard Glamorgi new make was significant in the new make stage, but not significant enough that if you treated it to the same cask regimen, you wouldn't end up homogenizing into something that essentially tasted like Glamorgi at the end of 10 years. The only difference was the yeast strain. So what, what Dr. Bill picked up on in the new make phase of that whiskey was there are differences. It's discernible substantive differences here, but I could squish them out if I used the same basic cask regimen throughout. So what he did was uh, 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 deviating from the norm. He matured Alta entirely in third fill X bourbon oak in order to better preserve the subtle differences that the yeast brought to the new make. That's the kind of stuff you have to do with Glenmo because it's pretty delicate stuff. Now, uh, if you if you compare and contrast that with the with the Yang of Ardbeg, that's where you don't have to worry about it so much. So that's sort of that's Cam's world from from here moving forward. Absolutely, yeah. So with with Ardbeg, because the new make spirit is, I mean, the new make Ardbeg is is quite interesting because it is a balance between this this large, robust, heavily peated, like beautiful uh, smoke, but then also some acidity that that starts to creep into kind of the corners as well. But you find with with Ardbeg being used in uh, as components, I think that that's its best application for for aging is because. Uh, Ardbeg, after if you were to take it out of cask and then start to finish it, you don't see as ma- much of a, a massive kind of flavor shift as you do over at, at the Glenmorangie household. Um, Ardbeg utilizes components because it, it's best to kind of approach them as creating, you know, their own spices in in a spice cabinet to be able to put together that dish with. Um, one of the reasons that I love Ugadal so much is because you get to have a conversation about not only you know flavor profile how something smells as well, but then also the the weight that that whiskey drinks with. And that's because uh, a component of it is wholly matured in in, uh, in sherry cask, right? And so that sherry cask brings a lot to the table. If 10 year was just finished for additional two years in sherry cask, we wouldn't have, you know, the same experience that we get when drinking a whiskey like Ardbeck Ugadal. Uh, so, so for us, because the the boat turns so much slower, uh, being utilized as whole components that are aged fully uh, in, in those casks uh, allows us to to take a different approach to ultimately compiling and putting a whiskey together in the blending stage. Is Cam, is that a little bit of of like a history of Ardbeg being used in blended scotches? A little bit of that where you say like the spice cabinet, like that mentality of like, we need to create this flavor and then now we need to create this flavor. Is it a little bit like residual off of that? 
Mm, well, I think in blended in blended scotches, they were Isla whiskeys were used for those robust characteristics, uh, and so I believe yes and no at the same time. I think that it's happenstance that that's just mm. how they were kind of applied in in blending. Um, I think that for Ardbeg specifically, right now, um, because of the the state of the distillery and the state of the brand, with trying to put together new whiskeys. Uh, it allows us to, and allows the whiskey creation team to have, a, you know, as much of a, a catalog as they can to be able to compile new whiskeys. Genius. All right. One more thing that uh, that Mike had asked about cognac, and this is this is because you guys have old enough stocks to look into this. Um, you have pre phylloxerid juice, right, on hand? Yep. Uh, yep. At, at Hennessy, so you can, and I'll show this question. You can go back. And look at what Uni Blanc on actual on historic Uni Blanc rootstock tasted like versus what it tastes like now. That totally. how different is it? I mean, uh, how how fundamentally has that shifted? Well, Uni Blanc um, was not was used very in small amounts. Pre oh, and you said that, yeah. So it was Faux Blanche and Colombard that were used largely uh, throughout the 1800s. Those were the primary grape barrels, and really, it was full blanche. Um, and full blanche after the uh, grafting process, and the grafting process was taking American rootstock, grafting it onto what we would call the noble varietals of European grapes, uh, giving them a resistance to this bug from North America known as Loxra. It, um, it fundamentally changed full blanche and Colombard. And so when we look at Full Blanche today, it's, you know, in cognac circles, that's what people, you know, people are hunting for it. But it's when you talk to cognac producers, they're like, but, but why? It, it doesn't taste, it's not the same as what it was. Uni Blanc after grafting tastes more like Full Blanche pre-grafting. And that's why the switch was oh, made. Oh, funky. And wow, so that's cool we, as hell. We have the stock, but there's very... You know, I, I'm going to say we probably, if we had any pre uh Uni Blanc, it, it, we wouldn't have multiple years of it. Whereas we have multiple years of a full Blanche going back pre Um Our oldest Eau de Vie is from 1800. It's not still in barrel, but we keep it in, in glass globes known as Dom Johns or Demi Johns um, when they're done maturing. And we do that for, for two reasons. One, for older blends, but two so that our master blender has a, a liquid catalog to go along with his ancestors' tasting notes and, and, and production notes uh, so that we can reference both the production notes historically, which we have all of, um, and the, um, the liquid history so that if anything were to happen, um, like global warming, phylloxera, many other pests and pestilence have come over throughout the years that haven't been as dominant. We can we can steer, we can we can navigate around those by tasting historically not only the tasting notes but also um, tasting the product itself. So it's it's a time capsule. You've 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 yeah. created a time capsule that you can it's go back. It's a flavor library. Yeah. Wow. That's. That's that's incredible. Um, uh, this has been a blast, by the way. Uh, there were. Let me just make sure that we didn't um, that we didn't miss anybody's uh, questions. It looks pretty good from this angle. Uh, man, I learned a lot, a lot more than I even a anticipated lot. learning. Uh, so yeah, Jordan, thank you so much for being a part of of oh, the you. art of blending. It does mean that we should probably do another one. Uh, specifically on maturation at some point. So uh, uh, if you, because because uh, as far as I know, there really isn't an example. Uh, you wouldn't char French oak for any reason, would you? And I've, I've never heard of a charred French oak cast. No, I, so I, that I see even that's, of itself. Yeah, that that's another. Even that alone is, you. yeah, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I'm as a matter of fact, I'm drinking a little EXO right now. A uh, little EXO Hennessy is blowing my mind. So uh, uh, you know, kudos to you guys for doing such amazing work over the course of uh, obviously since 1765. Um, Same to both of you. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, no, this is a blast. Next week we'll be back. Uh, we'll be talking about, geez, we'll be talking about stills. Speak to your Ooh. point, Mike Aiken, about still shape and size. We'll have two shows in a row. Oh, no, nope, no, nope, that's in two weeks. Sorry, I'm lying to you. Yep. Uh, anyway, tune in two weeks. Uh, next week we'll have uh, our pal Rich Buchanan from the uh, Mona Hennessy uh, education team on. I forget what we're talking about, but it'll be uh, riveting, I'm sure. Um, uh, Jordan, you've got, uh, you're at Mixing Jordan. Uh, on Instagram, so obviously yep. everybody check him out. He's he's uh, uh, not only a, uh, a walking encyclopedia of cognac knowledge, but a, a, a hell of a good uh, a cocktail maker as well. Uh, Cam, you've got your Monday and Friday show, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern, uh, Whiskey Through Food. Uh, that's an Instagram live show, uh, so everybody please uh, check and that Facebook out. And, at, and YouTube now. Oh, Right on. Good. All three. That's terrific. So you're Ardbeg, uh, at Ardbeg Cam on Instagram. Uh, we've got the Highlands to Islands YouTube channel and the Highlands to Islands uh, Facebook and Instagram pages. Uh, I'm at Glemo Dan. Uh, sign up for my newsletter or I will find you. Um, uh, so we'll be next, uh, back next week at 2 Eastern uh, to chat with our friend uh, Rich Buchanan in the interim. Thanks again, Jordan. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on the show and we'll do it again Thank soon. Thank both of you. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Talk to you soon.